When we're building a new wiring harness that's integrating CAN bus wiring into it, can be a little bit challenging. In this module, we'll have a look at a technique that can really help us get a nice, tidy and reliable result. If you're fairly new to wiring, I highly recommend checking out our dedicated motorsports wiring course, which covers splicing and everything else in between in a lot of detail. From here on though, we'll assume you have a good understanding of the base skills involved. First, we need to think back to the discussion on CAN bus wiring in general, and that we have a main trunk that runs through the entire vehicle, and devices are connected to this trunk via shortened nodes. Now it's time to have a look at making the connection between that trunk and those nodes. The tricky part of splicing CAN bus wiring comes about because we're always working with a twisted pair of wires. The key to getting a tidy result here is staggering the splices so they're not directly lying next to one another, which would create a bulky point in the harness. Although we're going to insulate our splices, staggering them also limits the possibility of any short occurring between the can high and the can low lines. Either open or closed barrel splices can be used, with small sections of Raychem SCL used for insulation. Your splices will always either be behind a connector or at a transition point in the harness, so will be located behind a rigid booted part of the harness, making sure they won't see any strain and will be nice and reliable. I've got a fairly representative demonstration set up here. We're going to create a small section of CAN bus wiring that's going to represent the main trunk passing through a transition point with uh, two nodes coming out of that. So what we'd call this would be a one in and three out splice because our trunk is going to be one in and one of those outs and we're going to have two nodes coming off that as well. So to show that, I've got some example wire uh, set up here. So this is pre-twisted uh, and we've got our three uh, which are going to be on the outside and our one which is going to be on the inside here. Now often the inside uh, will actually be very, very close to a connector body. So it's quite possible that these wires won't actually be twisted because if you're placing that splice directly behind a connector body, it's going to be much easier for these sections of wire to be straight and then be pinned into the connector. That's not going to cause any issues because those two uh, can, the can high and the can low wires there are still very close to one another. So they'll still see the same level of radiated electrical noise. Uh, so don't stress if you're performing a splice like this and you've got straight wires just being pinned into your connector. So the first thing I'm going to do here is actually just untwist a good section of our wire uh, between 30 and 40 millimeters and we're just going to do that on all of these and then we're going to have to trim the ends of the wire uh, to give us our stagger that we're going to need. So when we're trimming the wires to get the staggered point where our splice is going to occur, we've got to trim all the wires on the inside of the splice, uh, inverse to those on the outside of the splice. So that'll make a little bit more sense as I do it here. So I'm going to start on the inside of the splice. And here I'm simply going to trim our white wire, which for my standard coloring scheme, I have white as can high and green as can low. So I'm going to trim uh, the end off this white wire here. And I'm going to trim around about 15 millimeters off because that's gonna give us a good distance between our two splice points. They're gonna be nicely staggered away from one another. Now for all our other sections of wire here, to get those to meet up, I'm going to have to trim them the inverse. So I'm going to have to trim our can low or our green wire. So I'll go ahead and trim those now all the same amount. Now we've got all those trimmed and our splices are going to meet up nicely, keeping our entire bundle nice and straight. Uh, we need to strip the insulation off the wires to give us a point to actually crimp onto that copper. I've got my ideal stripping tool here, which is uh, excellent for the TXL wire that we're working with for this demonstration. When I'm doing this, I might actually just need to untwist a little bit more of that wire, just so my wire strippers have a good point to grab onto. So we'll go ahead and get all that insulation stripped.
We've got all our wiring prepped now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get one of my open barrel splices installed into my crimp tool. Now I've used 22 gauge TXL wire here. So 22 gauge TXL wire has an individual CMA of the wire of 700. So all up we've got 2800 of CMA of copper to crimp together and these are that's well within the range of the open barrel terminals I'm using here. Uh, talking about CMA, that's circular mill area, that's the actual area of the copper conductor strands and we do go through that in a lot of detail in our wiring course. So I'm going to get this open barrel splice installed into our tool here. Now because I'm using our ratcheting open barrel crimp tool here, it's really nice, it'll actually hold itself in that position. That's going to keep our open barrel crimp in place and let us line up all our wires. Splicing like this is something it would be really handy to have a third hand for, so if you've got a small bench top vise or something like that, you might be able to make use of it to make the job a little bit easier. There's a key thing we have to remember to do at this step though, and that is to install our pieces of heat shrink. Because we're dealing with twisted pairs of wire, particularly in this example on both the uh, in side of the crimp and the outside, if we don't put our heat shrink on now we're not going to be able to uh, tidily do that afterwards. So I'm going to get everything lined up on our can high wires here, on the outside of our crimp, and then I'm going to pop a piece of our Raycam SCL over there. And that's actually going to help us out as well because it's going to uh, help keep those wires together and let me line them up to get them all into our open barrel splice. So just holding those and squeezing them together, we can get those through into our tool. Double checking we've got all our copper conductors coming out the other side. Then from this side I'm going to install our inside of the crimp. Just double checking everything's in place there. Squeeze the handles and crimp that splice down. So looking at that we've got a nice reliable crimp connection there. Give it a bit of a tug test. I can really pull on that quite hard and it's not coming apart. So that's going to be a nice reliable splice join. Uh, we know that was going to be the case because we looked at the sizing of our open barrel terminal and we determined it was going to be correct for the size and number of wires that we're working with here. Now it's exactly the same procedure except we're going to crimp our can low wires together. So I'm going to install our heat shrink just here to make sure we've got that out of the way. Get another one of our open barrel splices just into our tool. Get everything lined up. And this is the point where things are actually a little bit trickier because we're performing a splice operation but we've got the rest of the wires already connected over here. So can be a little bit tricky to maneuver your fingers around to get everything in place. The key thing you need to be sure of though is when you've got all these wires installed into this open barrel splice and you're about to perform the crimp operation that the crimping tool isn't going to pinch any of the other wires that are in there. So I'll just get all these in here. Double checking everything's coming through the other side of our splice there. Install this side. Everything nicely lined up. When I crimp that down the jaws of the crimp tool are going to miss all the other wires and nothing's going to be inadvertently pinched. So once again, just having a wee look, I've got a good reliable crimp join there that's folded over nicely. Tug test, it's nice and tight, that's definitely not coming apart. We can now slide our pieces of SCL just across those crimp joins and head over to our heat gun and recover those down. So 
So we've got our heat shrink recovered down there. Splices are nice and tight and you can see they're staggered. Uh, so there's no chance of any shorts between our can high and our can low wires there. And it's not going to be too bulky. Now, as mentioned, uh, joints like this are always going to be behind a connector body. So beneath a rigid booted section or in a transition point of the harness, which will also be a rigid booted section. But you still want to keep them staggered like this as it uh, really keeps the harness nice and slim. As you can see, having to deal with the twisted pair does mean the splicing is a little bit trickier, but all of our same splicing rules apply. For a professional motorsport wiring harness, I typically use 22 AWG Tefcel wire and I purchase it in a pre-twisted pair. However, the current requirements for bus wiring are very low, so moving to a 24 or even 26 AWG wire is possible, provided you're working with connectors that accept these sizes of wire. Often moving to the smaller size wire can help with the concentric layout planning as well. For a club level spec harness, I use the same 22 AWG TXL wire the rest of the harness is mainly made up from, and I twist it myself using the drill method. These harnesses are not usually concentrically laid, so that extra bulk is not an issue. That was just one of the modules taken from our CAN bus communications course. If you're building a motorsport vehicle that'll use CAN bus systems, or you're interested in the data that's flowing on the CAN bus in your existing road vehicle, then this course is perfect for you. You'll learn why CAN is so widely used and the massive benefits it offers in both wiring simplicity and overall system flexibility. You'll learn about the CAN protocol from a low level, ensuring you have the knowledge to correctly set up all of the electronic devices in your project, getting them talking to one another seamlessly. You'll learn about the common tools used in interfacing with existing CAN bus systems, how to get the data from the network onto your laptop, and then how to interpret this data to tease out the important information that it contains. You'll learn how to plan and construct the CAN bus wiring, why it's constructed like it is, and how this ensures your devices will communicate reliably at the highest speeds. There's no standardized process among manufacturers for setting up CAN devices to communicate, so we ensure that you have a good overall understanding of the CAN protocol that will help you navigate through the processes getting your system working flawlessly. We tie all this knowledge together with several practical demonstrations of working with CAN systems to show you two simple five-step processes to follow to either construct your own CAN system or reverse engineer data from an existing CAN system. We then show these processes in detail, being put into practice on real projects. We'll show you the real world considerations, the pitfalls to avoid, and how robust and satisfying the final outcome is. This course starts with the very basics of the CAN protocol, and once they're solidified, introduces more advanced topics. So if you're completely new to CAN, this is the course for you. If you'd like to find out more about this course, click the link. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up, and if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.